Hey everyone, hope everyone's enjoying my cosplay of Drake Bell appearing before the Court of Law. Uh, today, I'm going to be reviewing the final episode of Doctor Who Flux, six episode journey to this point, The Vanquishers. <sighs> Hello everyone, we are gathered here for the end. Yeah, this is the final episode of Doctor Who Flux, series 13, the latest series of Doctor Who, my favorite TV show. Uh, the Chibnall era has not been a joyous occasion for most of its run. Uh, Flux has been hyped up ever since it was announced as, you know, maybe the final good Chibnall series. This is the one he put the most attention into, the most thought and effort and character development and, you know, serialization and all this jazz. This is the one. This is his magnum opus. And throughout Flux, you know, we've had the episodes come out weekly. I've been reviewing them. Uh, there have been some ups, there have been some downs. Uh, general consensus, a tiny bit better than Series 12 in my opinion, but a lot of mystery and not a lot of substance. But I think especially after Episode 5, Survivors of the Flux, it is clear that this is the episode that is going to make or break the entire series. Online reception for this episode is as mixed as it could possibly be. I cannot get a pulse on what people think of this one, so I figured... I'm done waiting. I've been putting this off for way too long out of just a fear that I'm not going to be able to conduct a very good review. You know, I have to be in the right headspace when I watch these. I have to be able to have an open mind and, um, you know, take note of the good and bad stuff. If I'm in a sour mood, I'm going to have a sour review, and that's no fun. So I sat down today. I watched the episode. I took notes on it, and um, this is my review. <sighs> Here we go. I have the most jumbled thoughts on this episode out of anything in Flux, and I, there have been some real big contenders. I will be, as I always do, going through every single scene, talking about it, what I liked, what I didn't like, and of course, a comprehensive review of Doctor Who Flux overall, since this is the finale after all. And, uh, you know, we're gonna have the complete picture after this episode. Let's do it. So, for the first scene of The Vanquishers, we segue right where we left off in Episode 5 with Survivors of the Flux, this whole cliffhanger at the end with Te Tectinium being killed by Swarm, and then he's coming to face off against the Doctor. He's saying, and now, Doctor, you. And that's exactly where we heard the uh, sound effect at the end of Survivors of the Flux. With The Vanquishers, we just carry on right from that moment in time. Literally the first scene, we see Swarm saying, and now, Doctor, you. And then we just keep going. Ooh. Now you- Oh! This is new. Uh, the doctor's solution from that cliffhanger was just... to run away, and Swarm and Azir just kind of watch her do it. So... Cliffhanger is in Doctor Who Flux, continue to be... completely nothing. Uh, and we're trying to get out of this whole predicament that we're in. Swarm and Azir are at the Division Headquarters. They're in control of the final Flux event. Uh, so we're trying to work out how to get out of this predicament that we're in, get back to the universe, and solve everything. Tech Taeyun's Ood is with the Doctor, and they're kind of working together to get away from Swarm and Azir, who are menacingly walking towards them. Uh, the Doctor is asking about the conversion plates, which is this whole thing from the start of Survivors of the Flux, where the conversion plate is just like a badge that you wear, and it makes it so you can exist out of the universe, just... You know, a science in fiction thing. Uh, but here, uh, Chris Chibnall is establishing that if you remove your conversion plate, you just return to the universe. And she eventually gets to taking that off, and there's some more uh, lore avenues with that that are, is going to be really important in this episode in a second here. But uh, before she does that, uh, Swarm and Azir come around the corner. Can you locate my TARDIS? <laughs> and they present the fob watch to the doctor. They tease her, they'd say, you want your memories? This fucking fob watch. Oh, also, let's remember, I called this at the end of Survivors of the Flux. The Doctor cannot get that fob watch and get her memories at the end, because it'll be a complete contradiction of Flux's themes. This whole idea that the memories aren't really what she needs. She thinks she needs them because of some reason, but she does not need them. We establish that in The Timeless Children at the end when the Ruth Doctor confides with her, and we establish it in Revolution of the Daleks when Ryan talks to her in the TARDIS. This whole journey in Flux is to establish that even when we do get presented with the option of the memories, we're not going to take it because we don't need it. And that's going to be the whole message. So if she does get them, the message is broken. The Doctor stares at it for a while before just taking the conversion plate off, 
and bloop, she's out of the scene. Following that, we're back with Yaz, Jericho, Liverpool Man, and Dan. I can't forget Dan. And they're in <sighs> Liverpool Man's tunnels, his magical time tunnels, with all the doorways, and the Sontarans are coming out and shooting at them, and Yaz opens the forbidden door, uh, which Liverpool Man in episode 5 said, this is the door that kills you. Don't open that door. So Yaz opens it and kills the Sontarans. And that is how that cliffhanger gets solved, so that was fun, I guess. Opening the death door. That was convenient. Uh, and then everyone's in a tizzy because there are Sontarans coming, probably, so they're all trying to run into doors. They run into one of the doors. It's just a lava lake, I guess. And then they go back through it, and they're just looking around the doors, and they eventually find one that's labeled December 5th, 2021, which is obviously the date that this episode was released, so this is the present day, and yes, as I predicted back in episode 5, Liverpool Man exists just to get the companions out of the past. It must be a shift in time rather than space. I think you might what does that mean? Of course, because of course, this a door puts him right where they want to be. And I maintain this is not how you write characters. You don't write characters to be functions in the story. This is something that Shibnall has done his whole run. Liverpool Man is the most egregious example in my opinion. He is the first scene of Doctor Who Flux. He's been in one scene in every episode except for episode 4, I believe. It was a cumulative four scenes before we got the reveal that he is Joseph Williamson, uh, who is actually a real person, by the way, and I did not know that. I look it up later. But he is behind the Williamson tunnels, which are the magical time tunnels that are going to get the companions back to the present day. He has not been a character. He has been a cog in the plot. And I didn't love that. So just reiterating how dumb that is in case everyone forgot, but they take this magical door to get back to the present day, as I immediately predicted. And we cut away fairly quickly to the Doctor being teleported into the scene with Dogman and Bell on the Lupari ship at the end of Episode 5. What? She's just with Dogman and Bell? The only rules that we get for how the conversion plate works is that when you remove it, you return to the universe. Which I guess means it just plops you right where you need to be for the plot to continue. Again, total coincidence, out of all of the places in the entire universe, it sets her right the fuck here, in between Dogman and Bell, where she can just go from here and solve the conflict of the episode. The Doctor talks to Dogman and Bell, asks questions that we get no answers to, uh, until we cut away to Dan, Yaz, Jericho, and Liverpool Man in the 2021 uh, Williamson hub world. <laughs> Uh, where Kate Stewart just appears and holds him at gunpoint. Ooh, Kate, what the hell? Madam, who are you? And what are you doing? Oh, this is 2021 now. Yeah. Readings for our God, this fucking guy. Two of you have uh, asks who they are, and she has Artron energy readings, so she knows that they're associated with time travel. The companions are asking how she knows the Doctor, and then she just casually reveals that the TARDIS is here. The TARDIS is here? Why? Wait, where did we see it last? And if we remember, the last time we saw the TARDIS, it was in 1967 in a village somewhere. So it has been brought to the Williamson Tunnels of all places in 2021. So that's like what? Contrivance number six, five minutes into the episode? Great. And then five seconds later, we get contrivance number seven, where the Doctor magically appears into the scene and has a nice reunion with all her companions. Kate. Kate. Stupid. Here? Why is here? No, sir. Dude, oh my god. Chris! Chris, what are you even trying to do? The doctor magically enters the scene. Uh, again, out of all of the places in the entire goddamn universe, she landed right here in the middle of this encounter, right when they happen to be talking about her. And it's from here that we realize the Doctor is split across time. There are three different versions of the Doctor coexisting because she removed the conversion plate is why this is all happening. Came out of nowhere with Flux, this whole conversion plate idea. Literally, just barely established in the last episode. And then established in this episode to 
be a way to have three doctors in the plot so that we can resolve every single thing in flux nice and quickly. It's not gonna get explained, dude, because how could it? We see that the doctor is both with Dogman and Bell, uh, Kate, D Dan, Yaz, and Liverpool Man, and also Sorum, Azir, and Tex Hayun's Ood. So there are three different versions of the doctor that we are following in this story. It is so insanely confusing, especially when they begin to start sharing scenes and we start having flashbacks of scenes with other doctors. So it appears that there are like four or five doctors that we're following. It is the worst addition to this episode and a landslide. Do not love it. Uh, and then after that, we get the title card. Bum, bum, bum. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. After that, we see a Sontaran radio message. This is the second Sontaran invasion of Earth that we're getting in flux. Super derivative. This is happening almost exactly as it did in episode two. They want to create an allegiance with the Daleks and the Cybermen for whatever reason they're in this episode later on. Uh, but he's saying, we will protect you from the flux if you come to us. We're invading Earth. Uh, most scenes in this episode are very, very short. Most don't linger for longer than two minutes, which is a really bad sign. It's an hour of, like, two-minute cuts between so much fucking stuff. But after that very brief scene of the Sontaran PSA, we see the Doctor with Bell and Dogman, where she's taking command of the Lupari ship that they're in uh, from Episode 5, and kamikaze right into the Sontaran battle fleet on Earth. It was a very weird scene. There's so much going on. Why? Oh, okay, so Kamikaze. Okay. Dr. Kamikaze for some reason. Okay. So that was just a completely misguided scene. We have the Doctor basically just committing suicide to Kamikaze into the Sontaran fleet, with Chris obviously establishing that it is a force field. You can't just ram into it, which is a weird thing that he's establishing. But it's also a contradiction of the Doctor. Uh, as a person, you know, she has no desire for self-sacrifice, but she's not going to take others down with her, aside from, like, Wilf in the end of time. But even then, he he pulled out and then just went on his own. So yeah, here, the Doctor is just intending to kill herself and Dogman and Bell, which is really dumb. We find out later that this was an intentional decision from the Doctor to try and get captured by the Sontarans so that she can get what she wants. It's the most cliche thing ever that she just does this completely inexplicable thing, crashes right into the Sontaran forest field, endangers both of the people she's sharing this space with, and then says, oh, I knew that would happen. Just, this is not how I would expect a doctor to act at all. I'm gonna need names for all these doctors, because we cut back to them a lot. Um, okay, so the one that's with Azure Swarm and the Ood, I'm gonna call Division Doctor. Uh, the one that is with Kate, Dan, Yaz, and Liverpool Man, I'm going to call the Tunnels Doctor. And then the third one I'm going to call the Dogman Doctor. So we cut back to the Division Doctor with Swarm and Azir. They, we are still in the scene where they are holding up this watch and teasing her with her memories. Swarm opens the watch and we get a cool little zoom into the <laughs> Time Lord consciousness of the Doctor where we see this mysterious floating house from episode 2, War of the Sontarans. I can rend them all to dust. But this doesn't make any sense either. This is not how the Fob Watch functions. It's not a secret portal that takes you into your mind palace. It's a Time Lord consciousness. Like, what the hell is this? It doesn't make any sense. Why is it embodying a house, and why are they standing there? Like, he can just do this? What is physically happening? So far, most of everything feels completely fabricated. I don't feel any threat from Swarm and Azure because they're so clearly just stalling for the plot and until the Doctor eventually saves the day with her other incarnations, it just feels so insuspenseful and I didn't love that throughout this episode. So these three Doctors have just completely neutered any threat in the episode because they're just kind of Boop, 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 around the plot, saving the day. Really fun. And then we cut back to the tunnels doctor where she's talking to everyone in the tunnels. And uh, she's talking about how there's a whole plan that she has and she's she's just giving everyone a pep talk, a little, little checkup. This is the first time she's seen the companion since Village of the Angels. This is ridiculous, dude. Why it's... Oh my god. 
Eccentric English businessman, flinch based and property owner who's best known, Williamson Tunnels. Which were constructed under his direction in the Edge Hill area. Wow, I thought that was a Christian Mall invention. That's cool. Also, the Suntarans are back. No explanation as to why. No explanation as who the Grand Serpent is. How he's working with the Suntarans. Why. Why he's here. And then we see this Santaran invasion, this big Santaran invasion. There's Santarans everywhere. They're imprisoning the humans again. I was so invested in this. It was just awesome. We have a couple shots of Santarans around Liverpool. Uh, just in formations marching along. Uh, we see, we enter one uh, corner store where a Santaran is ordering his squad to leave. And then he just eats chocolate. So we're establishing a new thing with the Santarans that they have a weakness in chocolate. Colors. Let's make the Santarans weakness chocolate. So we can advance the fucking goddamn it. Hello. And we have a whole scene where the doctor just kind of blips in and creates an alliance with this Santaran in exchange for fucking chocolate. Having actually finished this episode, I don't... I mean, there's maybe one scene where this is a setup to something else. In general, I don't think this was needed in any way. Totally random scene that establishes another weakness of the Santaran, so they just continue to be neutered in every every single scene. You know, if it wasn't bad enough that they have a spot on their neck that they just get knocked out from. Now, they need energy for their suits, and they love chocolate. Just bring a chocolate bar and wave it in front of their face, and they'll go away. Didn't love that. Following that, we get a really, really interesting scene, and this is one that I'm still on the fence about in my feelings for, uh, where it, uh, the Doctor and Dogman are imprisoned in the Santarans. They're about to be interrogated by the Santarans, and uh, the Doctor is confronting Dogman about seeing him in Once Upon Time in the past, uh, and we get a confirmation that Dogman was the Doctor's old companion. The Fugitive Doctor's companion is Dogman. What? I can't tell if this is good or bad. I'm so on the fence right now. I can't tell if it's good or bad. I think it's equal parts dumb and equal parts kind of moving. I think the performance is good and the score is good. I just don't know if the idea is good, but I think it's... it's I, I give it a pass. I say Dogman is cool enough. Sure, why not? And then we're back with the Division Doctor. Again, so many fucking cuts in this episode. But yeah, we're with the Division Doctor where she is getting bullied by, she's getting bullied by Swarm and Azura. They're torturing her with her memories and their mind powers uh, just to delay the inevitable escape that she's going to have. Uh, and Azura uh, gets down and talks with the Doctor and they have an exchange about, like, good and evil, and I guess I'll let it play. It's a very weird scene. You don't get to die yet because we're going to give you just enough time to save the day in the end. What? You want to keep things alive. You want creatures to breathe and live. Naturally. You want species and races to build. Where are you going with this? Into your mind and your hearts. And I don't know why you want it so much. Really long-winded way to say, your evil is my good. I'm Sutek the Destroyer. Where I tread, I leave nothing but dust. And darkness, if you know that episode, you're a real one. Actually, it's a pretty popular episode, so Ending never mind. With I find that good. And then, we will... uh, and then we're back again with the Dogman Doctor in their cell with Dogman. And uh, the Grand Serpent walks in along with the Santaran General that I don't remember the name of. Uh, and he is talking to, I think, the Doctor, but it's mainly the exchange between the Santaran and Dogman where we establish that... The entire Lupari race has been wiped out off screen. Now, on those ships, out into space, that doesn't make any fucking sense. There were billions of them, is the cost of resistance to and they were in spaceships. Fight. Not one flew. God, it's so dumb. It all magically died off screen. Very thematically peculiar moment. I have so many moments like this in this episode where I'm like. This is kind of moving, but it's also kind of really dumb. So it, it, I have very mixed feelings with this episode, I feel. But it's a moment that we got. Suspend your disbelief, I guess. I don't know. 
But now Dogman is all depressed, and uh, the Doctor is removed from the cage and carried away to be interrogated by the Grand Serpent. Uh, we see that Belle has ducked out of all of this, and she's just hiding around on the Santaran ship. And then we cut away to uh, this mind void place where Vinder and Diane are from episode 5. So this is our first time seeing Vinder again. We're getting a tiny scene where they're plotting their escape from this place. This was inevitable. I saw it coming a million miles away, given how they handled this from Survivors of the Flux. It is such an endlessly predictable moment, and I felt no stakes in it. But Vinder was cool. Uh, I didn't love Diane, but whatever. She has one line where she just tells Vinder that uh, people underestimate me because they, they left me, in, and Swarm and Azir left me in here because they think I'm insignificant. But I'm going to tell the audience that I am significant to brainwash him into thinking that I was important to this episode. If everyone else is gone. To them, I'm insignificant. But I'm not insignificant. Obviously. Just tell me you're not insignificant. Um, Awful line. And we continue to get Mary Sue moments with Diane where she's established as some sort of underdog superhero, and she's more clever than people think. It feels artificial and constructed for them to get out of this scenario. Or to insert any relevance at all to Diane's character in the story. So they use this whole... I forget the name of it even. Uh, and insert it right now. Combination Bio form. Yeah, they use that to get out. They damage it. It's like a weakness in the simulation. So they he Vinder shoots it, and then they, they go up to the next level, which is this sand dune place uh, where it, uh, s the Doctor met Swarm for the first time in Flux back in that whole flashback from episode one. So this is the same dune place as before. We see this weird guard guy. I think this is like a monk of Atropos or something. I don't know who... These people, especially the guards... Don't make any sense. I've never understood them. I think I was supposed to take notes during the whole Fugitive Doctor scenes back in Once Upon Time when we saw them for the first time. I don't remember a single thing about them. Oh, and I also forgot, um, there is a scene with... <sighs> is her name Claire? I can't remember. Uh, Claire and Jericho from episode 4. Uh, she is in this episode, by the way. I forgot to... Man, I did I for... Really? Man, I did not take a lot of good notes. Uh, but she is in this episode. She's back from a while. They go and fetch her... Um, the tunnels doctor go goes and does that uh, in the TARDIS because she has it magically. Uh, and they're infiltrating uh, the Santarans. They've been captured, obviously. And the Santarans want to extract the final flux event from their minds. They're basically undergoing intense in like interrogation or mind torture to extract the final flux event as information, which really confused me because Claire and Jericho don't know the date of the final flux event because it hasn't happened yet. So they're just accessing this information about the final flux event Where is Kate Stewart? by torturing their brains even though they have no information on it. They're essentially trying to extract information that they just don't have. But yeah, back with where we were before. Uh, so we're with the Dogman Doctor and uh, she's getting interrogated by the Grand Serpent we get some answers as to who he is, kind of. And I was a beloved ruler. Whoa, ego claxon. So what's the plan here? Let the Sontarans do the dirty work and betray them. Because but why is he here? Oh. Just for fun? He's just a really bad guy that is here for literally no reason. He is in no way associated with Flux. He is in no way associated with Division. He is only connected to Vinder. And he's just a bad guy that's here. So... I was expecting a lot more out of this guy. We didn't get that. He's just kind of here being an evil mastermind guy. Uh, the Grand Serpent is about to kill the Doctor with his evil CGI snake. And then we get this. Please stop torturing me. Like immediately. Ooh, magic. Two Doctors. Why is this happening? What? How does this service the story other than getting the Doctor magically out of trouble here? So for the rest of the episode, we have to endure these torturous scenes where the Doctor is just talking to herself. For most of the Doctor scenes throughout this episode, we're following two Doctors who are sharing dialogue in the same place. They are exactly the same character. They are saying exactly the same things. There is exactly zero reason we needed to do this, unlike something like the Metacrisis Doctor, who is distinguishably different from the Tenth Doctor. But we have two Doctors. If you're having multiple Doctors in the same space, in the same episode, it is inevitable to have them meet each other. So that's what we're getting here. 
And that's what we get in the immediate scene after this, where Belle is trying to contact Vinder through her little uh, computer guy, which is also her baby somehow. Uh, but she's trying to contact Vinder through the Santaran computers before the two doctors run into the scene and they all kind of just take off being chased by the Santarans and being shot at. They all evacuate into the TARDIS and fly away. Uh, not before Dan rescues Dogman from his prison. And, you know, Dogman's depressed now because his entire race is dead. Uh, but they, they, they have a nice little exchange where, uh, you know, they tease each other. It was nice. In the doggos, are you? Uh oh. <laughs> now it's just a sad dog. We get a mountain of dialogue between these two doctors on the TARDIS that I don't remember most of. I think it's here that Vinder calls the TARDIS and asks to be rescued. I think it's here. It might be in a future scene. That's the only thing I remember about this dialogue. And Kate calling for some reason. Just a completely pointless scene with a lot of dialogue. I can't follow two doctors, bro. They're just saying the same stuff anyway, there's no reason for it. We're back with Jericho and Claire, where the Santarin has somehow extracted the Final Flux event, even though none of them know about it. Um, maybe this is an allusion to the Santarin being bribed with chocolate. It might be, I'm pretty sure it's the same Santarin because they're both played by Strax, I think, if my memory isn't failing me. So maybe that's what this is, but it really weird scene. That felt just like fluff. Along with uh, the Grand Serpent's confronting the general and saying that the doctor has escaped with her clone and uh that he wants to find kate so in the next scene we see him interrogating a random civilian with his cgi back snake asking where kate is and this random guy knows that she is in the williamson tunnels because it's literally like an extra that has two lines he is a new character he just gets <laughs> killed by the Grand Servant, but not before saying, of course, that Kate is in the Williamson Tunnel, so whatever. Williamson's tunnel. How does he know that? We cut away back to the tunnels with the Tunnels Doctor, and this is where things get confusing, uh, and where it appears that there are more than three Doctors, because I believe this is a flashback to when she was talking with all of the characters at the beginning, which is very confusing because there's no audio or visual effects to distinguish between this is a flashback to a previous scene in time or it's happening you know all at the same time because the tunnels doctor went and saved dogman doctor from being interrogated yet she is also in the tunnels in this scene to talk to liverpool man here but she's also in the tardis with the dogman doctor where they're having their funny two doctors dialogue so it appears that there are four doctors when really it's only three and this is happening in the past. But yeah, it's here that we say goodbye to Liverpool man. He is, the doctor sends him back to his time. Uh, he says, she says that he's too important to the course of time and that this is their battle and that they need to win it. Uh, and he just kind of agrees and then he steps through his door and he never comes back again. This is the end of Liverpool man. Goodbye Liverpool man. Madness. I really wanted more from you. I genuinely can't follow these three doctors. After this, what I'm believing to be a flashback, we go back to the normal progression of time with the Tunnels Doctor and the Dogman Doctor in the TARDIS coming to save uh, Vinder and Diane from the Void Place. There's two here. There's one at Division, and then there's the one in the tunnels. Unless they're just all... Oh my god, whatever. They're honing in on her signal because apparently this void place is just a physical place that the TARDIS can land in. I didn't know that, but apparently it is. But that's exactly what happens. The TARDIS lands and Vinder and Diane enter the TARDIS where Belle and Vinder finally meet. Hi. <laughs> Miss you. Miss you more. And then we cut away quick as lightning back to the Division Doctor where Swarm teleports her to the Temple of Atropos. And we don't see Division Doctor until the very end of the story in the resolution. So this is the last time we see the Division Doctor. For the rest, it's just Tunnels Doctor and Dogman Doctor. Uh, and in that vein, we see the entire gang gearing up for battle. We have Tunnels Doctor, Dogman Doctor, Dogman, Bell, Vinder, Dan, Yaz, Jericho, and Claire. All in the TARDIS. Nine fucking characters in the TARDIS. Uh, gearing up to take down the Santarans. Oh no, sorry. Claire and Jericho are not in the TARDIS. Yet, they eventually get into it because they somehow 
escape the interrogation room without being killed by that one Santarin. Again, I'm assuming it is the bribery with the chocolate that set this up, but they get out of their inter their uh, torture chairs and then use these teleport rings to teleport to the TARDIS. So now we have all nine characters in the TARDIS and we're gearing up to take down the Santarans. It is in this five-minute scene that all of the entirety of the threats of Flux are destroyed, and I'm going to walk through it now very slowly. So Tunnel's Doctor, Dogman Doctor, Dogman Vinder, and Bell all enter a Santaran ship, uh, knock out the two guards, and then uh, take control of the Santaran computer to... Uh, or the Lupari computer, because this is Lupari ship, uh, to disperse the Lupari formation. Hang on. See, this makes no sense. Okay, so in spatial awareness. So what this is, this is the Santarans, the Cybermen, and the Daleks, and this is the Santarans' big trick against them to get them killed by the Flux. But the thing with this is it's the Santarans, the Cybermen, and the Dalek ships on this side, and then we have these uh, Lupari wall here, and then... I'm assuming the Earth is behind them over here, so they're all on the side of the wall. Um, and then the Lupari formation, I believe, disperses, and this is maybe by um, the Santarans. This is their big trick to kill the Cybermen and Daleks. So the formation disperses, and the Daleks and Cybermen die. Apparently, it's either by like some sort of sabotage by the doctor and company that gets the Santarans killed but the entire Santaran ships are there uh and the, Lupar the lupari spaceship wall is gone so the flux is coming the Santarans are there i'm assuming they opted to either teleport away or the formation would just reform and it's through some sort of sabotage that uh it does not reform so uh, the Santarans all get disintegrated by the flux and it's in a big dramatic moment where dogman avenges his people so the doctor is going to sabotage the system and then they're all going to die to the flux this came out of nowhere i don't this is not very good they backstab the santarans and they all get destroyed by the flux uh, but of course the earth is over here and the earth is about to get destroyed by the flux so one of the guards or some these weird statues across all of flux they're linked to the temple temple of atropos just Pops into the scene and absorbs the Flux. All of the Flux, the entire cataclysmic event of the Flux is absorbed by this statue person. <laughs> Makes no sense. I think the Santarin backstab moment is fine enough, but, you know, just to get the Flux for, to stop from killing the Earth, we have this guy just kind of, boop, he's in the scene, and he absorbs the entire mass of the Flux. Aside from the fact that we are once again neutering the threat of the Santarans, this is yet another thing on top of that. Such easy defeats, you know, hit him on the back of the neck, which is, you know, a weakness as old as time. And then we also have, they had need energy for their suits, they love chocolate, and you can just sabotage their computers like it's nothing. Just hit their two guards, and then the day is saved. So, I don't know. And then we get this. Just out in the corridor. I'm afraid that my options for exiting are rather non-existent. I can't what? get the TARDIS because of the pull of the flux. What? I no. More in my time with you than I did no. Two decades. Who has had a life like mine? Oh, man. You now nameless human. I see him. Professor Eustatius Jericho, Scourge of Scoundrels. Scourge of Scoundrels. If you were a good title, by the wrath of Santa, I will now execute you. I really don't think you're going to have time. God damn it. Shit, no, you're a fucking villain. <laughs> Jericho is killed in the end of Flux. Um, I was not ready for it. It hit me very, very hard. Well, not really that hard, I guess, but I don't know. I was really fond of Jericho. I think he was... 
I don't know if he was really a good character, but I think he was a really fun character, and he was a far cry from a boring character. He was a great contribution to Flux. He made the episodes a lot more enjoyable toward the back half. He was one of the only pieces of some of these that I really liked, specifically, you know, the last episode, Survivors of the Flux. Uh, to see him go was a real tragedy. Um, I will never forgive Chibnall for this. That is a joke. But I love Jericho, and uh, I was sad to see him go. I salute him, or I do my British salute, whatever. He was a good man, and uh, he will be remembered. And then we're back with the Division Doctor on the Temple of Atropos, where time takes physical form and talks to Azir, Swarm, and the Doctor. It takes the form of Swarm, so it's a clone of Swarm. Time is talking. Time is talking, guys. Time is literally talking. What the hell? I cannot stress how dumb this is, and it happened right at the end. I don't know why he did this, because, guys, I said this in the Once Upon Time review, time is time. This is the last thing I wanted out of Doctor Who Flux, or anything out of Doctor Who. It's honestly, in some ways, as equally as dumb as The Timeless Child. It's just another thing that Doctor Who has been avoiding doing for its entire run of being on television. You know, the last thing people wanted was the Doctor to not really be a Time Lord and said she's fucking Space Jesus and the origin for regeneration. And it's in the same vein, you know, we didn't want time to have a voice. We didn't want time to be associated with a temple and monks. Didn't love this. It was dumb. I've said it's dumb. I continue to think it is dumb. It is the dumbest thing in Flux. Sinks the whole thing. Without a doubt, in my opinion. But that's what we get. Uh, time takes physical form and talks to Swarm and Azure, where it punishes them for failing to destroy the universe. I don't fucking know. So they get disintegrated by time, and Azure drops the fob watch, and the Doctor finally is presented with the choice. So dumb. Here we are. This is it. Is she gonna take it or leave it? This is the moment. Chibnall, make or break your run. Uh, but before she can actually open it, uh, time takes physical form again as the Doctor. So the Doctor is talking to a clone of the Doctor. Uh, she is wearing the Fugitive Doctor's jacket, uh, the, you know, the inverse color ones from Once Upon Time, uh, where this whole scene exists to allude to uh, the Jodie Whittaker specials. What do you mean? What do you mean, their master? He will knock four times. The Jodie Whittaker specials. We get hints of uh, the 13th Doctor's eventual regeneration. It's establishing that the 13th Doctor will die and, you know, changes. It's the same as, you know, the end of, uh, what was it, Planet of the Dead? And, you know, the whole uh, prophecy with the 10th Doctor's eventual death, this is kind of exactly the same thing. And there's a lot of spiritual relation to the Chibnall era and RTD's era, especially since they both have their uh, one-year run of specials. We're going to have the David Tennant specials and the Jodie Whittaker specials. Uh, and we're going to have four of them, similar to the David Tennant specials. Uh, and it's exactly in the same vein that we're also getting allusion to the Master, where, you know, time drops the Master's name. So we have all that to look forward to in the Jodie Whittaker specials. Honestly, Kind of looking forward to it. I think the David Tennant specials are one of my personal favorites. It's, I think, my third favorite series of Doctor Who because I count it separately from Series 4. So I honestly have a ton of high hopes. I think Eve of the Daleks, I've seen the trailer for it, obviously, looks really creative and interesting. Uh, potentially good. You know, we'll see. And I think Doctor Who works best when it's just rooted in its themes. I like Doctor Who when it's not trying to do some sort of big, you know, time-bending lore shaking story i don't love that i just love when the eras stay in their eras they focus on their characters uh you know they have their strong characterization they end with moving send-offs and strong moments you know that's why i love the end of time part two and most of the run of the david Tennant specials is because it's such a self-contained personal dark you know journey of the 10th doctor where he becomes Time Lord Victorious and eventually backpedals to become, you know, the 11th Doctor and not go down the path of the Valyard. So maybe this will be as good as that. I have, honestly, 
a pretty good feeling that it'll probably be the best Shibnall episodes just because when the series are winding down to a regeneration, this is when the writers have peace with their work and this is their final contribution. So they really put a lot of time into those scripts. So I'm pretty sure they're naturally the better ones as the series goes on. We'll see. Uh, I have a fair bit of confidence, but uh, that's what we get. The scene ends with time restoring the doctor into her one self uh so she gets all compressed into one division doctor uh, tunnels doctor and dogman doctor all back into the 13th doctor as we understand her so we uh we got that all resolved all this plot's been resolved except for the grand serpent and it's here that vinder and kate uh just kind of cast him into a door and he's exiled for um forever they just kind of lock him on this rock in the middle of space where he is forced for, to be forever and uh yeah this is the end of doctor who flux this is our resolution we're getting all our final bits with the characters dogman vinder and bell are in our own little crew and they're sailing off to go on adventures we have a nice scene with them work there's trouble yeah, trouble well, <laughs> and the dog i wish i'd ever saved your life you're not staying any of you after that, we get Kate and Claire, where they're making peace, they're saying goodbye. Kate says that she likes the 13th Doctor, and she hopes that um, she'll see her again. Maybe allusion to the Jodie Whittaker specials? It's likely, but we'll see. And then we get a really weird scene where we're back with uh, Dan at the Museum of Liverpool, which I didn't really understand in episode one that he was talking about the Williamson Tunnels, which is, you know, I guess set up to Liverpool Man if you want to count it as that. But here we get uh, Diane uh, rejecting Dan in terms of getting a drink. So this is her, you know, not wanting to go on a date with him. Really weird scene. I was expecting a really touching Dan moment because one of my favorite scenes in Flux is from Once Upon Time, where Dan is talking to Diane about how, you know, he used to have a family and then his woman left him and he's all sad. And I thought that was a really moving scene and was written very surprisingly well for Chris Chibnall. So I was hoping to get something like that. I was really longing for that. Didn't get that. It was just a scene where a piano plays. And then Dan just hops right back into the TARDIS for more adventures. So it was a scene where Dan leaves the TARDIS. And then at the end of it, he's right back in it. Do you mind if we don't? No. I wasn't late. It wasn't my fault. Maybe not tomorrow. I'd better. weird what a weird moment and then the final scene of doctor who flux this is the last one uh the doctor is talking to dan and yaz they are going to continue to have adventures throughout uh the jody whitaker specials we know that already because we've seen them in the trailer for eve of the daleks but we have an exchange between yaz and the doctor where we have a heart to heart about how the doctor is sorry that she left them on their own and they had to make do on their own for two years the Doctor makes peace with this whole idea that she's been following throughout Flux, this whole thing that she needs the memory, she needs them, and she realizes that she's been neglecting her friends, which was a nice scene. I think the themes of the scene are nice. The dialogue wasn't my favorite thing. I think it just could have been written better. The acting was very good, though. And uh, Yaz leaves the scene, goes and uh, escorts Dan to his room out in the TARDIS, and we get the first tear of the Chibnall era, the first Doctor Tear of the entire run. Ooh, our first Doctor Tear out of the entirety of Chibnall's run. That was the first one. The end of his last season. Ooh. And then right at the end, we get the final, this is the whole thing that has defined the entirety of the Chibnall run. I've talked about this before in the actual reaction in Survivors of the Flux and right here. This is the entire thing. This is the most important thing in Doctor Who Flux. We've been establishing that in The Timeless Children and Revolution of the Daleks, the theme is that the memories is not what we really want. We shouldn't care about the memories. We shouldn't care about the past lives. It's a thing that we want, but it's not a thing that we need. And her journey, the Doctor's journey throughout Flux, is for her to realize that she does not need the memories. This is a false desire for her, and it is a toxic desire for her. So she has to realize in the end that... Even if she gets the fob watch, she does not want the memories. 
And throughout this entire episode, I was looking for the moment where she either picks up that fob watch and discards it or opens it and learns all her secrets. And it is here where the doctor says this. Do me a favor. Keep this safe. Somewhere deep within this TARDIS. Somewhere I can never find it. Thank God. This moment required more, but at least it's the right direction. It should have been a whole, I don't want this. Instead, it's just kind of like, Meh. oh God, no, he's leaving it up to, oh no. So it's left up to interpretation in the Jodie Whittaker specials. We're either going to see the doctor learning about her past, or she's just going to forget about it, which is what I think should happen, honestly. Uh, there's probably a small sector of the fan base that do want to see those memories. I kind of want to see them as well, I guess, just to care about it in any way, but it would be a contradiction of Flux's themes. I don't think it should happen. I think it'll be a complete step back for Flux and ruin it if we do see that in the Jodie Whittaker specials because, you know, we've been establishing time and time again that we don't want the memories, and if we do end up getting the memories in the end, well, what the hell kind of message are you trying to send, Chris Chibnall? As an ending, I would have liked more confirmation. I would have liked a moment where the doctor said, like, she picked up the fob watch. This is a miming of it. So she picks up the fob watch. This is her memories. This is the whole thing that she's been wanting the whole series. And she just takes it in. This is very impactful. This is the moment that she has been waiting for. And then she grips it in her hand, takes a deep breath, and just and chucks the thing off the temple or off the TARDIS out into space. That would have been a perfect moment. Or in a moment where the Doctor looks at it and just kind of gets really happy. Like, this is, yes. Oh, man. But then she realizes that this is creating a lot of toxic behavior in her. And that she ignored her friends. She ignored the people closest to her. And that this desire wasn't really a desire that she really wanted. And, you know, she starts to cry. She starts to break down. This is a really complicated feeling for her. You know, this is a mix of happiness, but this is also a mix of I'm feeding into the feelings that I shouldn't be feeding into. And then in a big emotional scene, she, in a fit of rage, throws it, which is, I guess, the perfect version. That is my perfect version of the Doctor discarding the memories. If you thought we should have seen that, let me know. But here, as a big, ooh, it's a mystery, you're going to find out later. It's not half bad, I guess. But yeah, that's the end of The Vanquishers, episode 6 of Doctor Who Flux. I've been talking for an hour and 30 minutes. I've been in the suit this entire time. I need to take off this tie. It is killing me. Um, so in the end, I think Chris did more or less the right approach with the fob watch and the Doctor's memories and the division. Um, I think... The execution to that point, the actual episodes, they weren't really fun episodes. They weren't engaging. The characters weren't always consistent. The Doctor herself wasn't always consistent. Uh, things were resolved by contrivance and contradiction time and time again in this series. We had some awful lines, some horrible moments, but I think a pretty clear vision. After seeing some interviews of Chris uh, talking about Dr. Flux, it's clear to me that this is a series that he was very, very passionate about. He had a lot of himself into this. This is the one that he put the most thought into. He had the most excitement for this. I think his better judgment, you know, more, the more uh, you know, negative sides of his writing did start to seep again, as they always do, into the series. Um, but I think his vision, honestly, remains pure throughout the whole thing. Whether it's a fun watching experience is to be decided for you. Some people love it. Some people, like I've seen people give Village of the Angels literally perfect scores. Like that is heaven sent levels of good there. So I, I don't agree with that at all. Village of the Angels is the best out of this lot, but I think it's probably like 65% out of 100. 
For me, I think episodes were still more bad than good. It doesn't help that there were only six episodes and that we had these threads from the past that made it hard for, you know, the OG Doctor Who fans to get in on this because they're faced with The Division, Tech Tao, and Timeless Child, all this stuff that nobody likes. But I think Chibnall takes good directions with an awful idea. And I think that's the bottom line for Flux. It's a good direction to take an awful idea. And I think, honestly, that is the cornerstone of this entire series. That is the headlining phrase that I'm going to approach. And when I look back on this whole series, it was a good step forward to an awful idea. It was rooted in an awful idea. It had awful elements. It had some awful stories. But it was, in the end, a good step forward for The Timeless Child. Episode 1 was misguided, had a ton of setup, had some funny moments, had some nice characters, a uh, good setup for Dogman and Dan, uh, some good setup of the rest of the series overall. I think at the time, everyone was upset because they wanted to see a big, you know, focused episode, and we didn't really get that in episode 1. Uh, I think it was still misguided and had some bad moments, but good enough setup for Flux. Episode 2, I maintain, had some bad ideas. I've belly ached about War of the Suntarans far too long. My voice hurts, so I'm not gonna not gonna go down that path. Once Upon Time, gimmicky, alienated the audience in some ways with how much it lingers on the past and is an obligatory way to set up exposition for its characters, but ultimately ended with a good, very good twist in that Bell and Vinder were, you know lovers and had some good dialogue especially at the end that i honestly that one good scene at the end where vendor looks at his destroyed planet and just doesn't say anything is the one and the scene with dan where he talks about his his ex um those are the only things that elevate once upon time for me and it makes it the best series because it has two really good scenes and an episode that's just gimmicky uh village of the angels the best of flux had a fun character in Jericho, had some a cool, gritty aesthetic, had some, again, cool character in Jericho. Really loved Jericho in Village of the Angels. It was a good direction for the Angels. I think the Peggy stuff weighted down a lot. I think the stuff in the past with Dan and Yaz weighted down a lot, but the stuff in modern day with Claire, except for the Division Angel stuff, uh, with Claire, Doctor, and Jericho, I think was pretty cool. Survivors of the Flux, uh, probably... Exempt from more of the Sontarans, the worst of um, Doctor Who Flux. If I, I'm going to rank them at the end in a second here. Uh, it was set up. It had a terrible, terrible idea. It, so much of the stuff that was established from Village of the Angels that came back in this one was not explained at all. This whole idea that the companions have been traveling on their own for two years and they own a boat. And of course, the unforgivable sin of making Liverpool Man, you know, the MacGuffin that gets them back to the present day in The Vanquishers. I didn't love all that stuff. Uh, makes uh, Survivors of the Flux a very unfun episode for me to revisit. But in a large sense, it was mostly set up to the Vanquishers. I might be high on this episode right now. I can't really tell. I really am grateful that Chibnall did not give the Doctor her memories at the end. I'm grateful that he didn't do some of the more silly things, although he did make the Doctor into three different people, just to resolve all of the crazy shit he has established throughout his series so i think maybe more closer to a mixed bag than i would like to admit so if i was to rank them i would do war of the sontarans survivors of the flux the halloween apocalypse once upon time nope uh the vanquishers once upon time and village of the angels from worst to best of course And this is it. This is my final video on Doctor Who Flux. This is the end. I hope you've enjoyed my reviews. Um, I... (laughs) I've spent so much time watching these episodes and my voice hurts. I... uh, By the way, the reason this episode took so long to make and get out is I've been, you know, uh, grinding out the remastered video essay. You know, we have... How much time do we have? Uh, 15 days until it has to get done. I still have to finish the Chibnall era. I have to finish... Uh, chapter 10, What It Means to Me, and the epilogue. Three, well, two small chapters and one big chapter uh, that have not been finished yet in 15 days, so I'm focusing very hard on that. I suspect I'll be able to, don't worry about it, I'll get it out, you can count on me, but yeah, that's why I'm dedicating my time to it, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, That's why it took so long to make this one. 
Uh, I hope this was a worthy review to end it off on. I think I was pretty fair to this episode and Flux overall. I think it is just a very complicated series of Doctor Who. Um, I had the most confusing roller coaster of a time with this one. I think with series 11 and 12, they're just objectively so bad. With Flux, we're closer to maybe something that people will enjoy, at least, you know, on a fundamental basis. But I think for me, there's a lot of dumb stuff um, that me, as a hardcore Doctor Who fan, can't really get behind. But I think a capacity for enjoyment is present here. And if you do like Flux, I don't blame you for it. I can totally see that. But yeah, I'm done. I've been talking for how long now? Nearly two hours. Oh my god, my voice is shredded. I'm going to go now. It's been a joy. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to get out of this suit and uh, continue to finish the remastered video I was saying. And I guess I'm uploading this on December 11th. So in 14 days, I'm recording this on the 10th. In 14 days, you'll have the remastered video essay. Hopefully, you know, if all goes according to plan. And I hope you enjoy it because I'm putting a lot into it. Anyway, I'm done. I'm giddy. I'm going to go get back to editing. Well, I'm going to edit this video and then get back to editing the remastered video. I'll say goodbye. It's been a joy. Thank you for watching my reviews of Flux. I was not expecting this response. I just thought it would be fun to review Flux. And I did. And you guys have been here for it. And I'm so grateful for that. So, uh, yeah, thank you, and uh, 